The Craft World Eldar were a faction whose mobility and firepower made them a constant uh, sight at the top tables in many events. As missions change to being able to actually hold objectives to the uh, following turn, we see some significant changes to how you will want to play Eldar in 9th edition. So let's take a look. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some of the positive changes to Eldar first, yep. uh, and then we'll talk about some of the things that maybe hit them and were not so uh, good, uh, and then we'll talk about some combos, uh, look at some lists, yeah. and kind of give you a, a breakdown of all the changes to the game and how that might affect how you build your Eldar. Okay, so yeah, that sounds great. I think the first thing that maybe we want to go over is a change that we've seen across the game, which mm -hmm. is allowing vehicles to move and shoot without penalty, That's but right. of course... Eldar have a lot of vehicles that were already suffering from this move and shoot penalty, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of vehicles that are super crazy fast yes. that wanted to be moving, but otherwise would have been standing still. That's right. Yeah, we're thinking especially of things like the uh, the Night Spinner and the Fire Prism that, and they have like a 16 inch move in some cases, yeah. very, very fast, but they didn't want to move because they would take that uh, to hit uh, penalty. Yeah, uh, even those Crimson Hunter X arcs yes. uh, took a huge bonus. We, we had that really tasty upgrade from Psychic Awakening that allowed you to ignore that, um, but now, with, at, without going away, I know for sure I'm going to be looking at things like the 5-up Invuln to yep. fill that slot. Um, so it makes them very, very flexible and that much more killy. This is one of the largest collections of vehicles that I think benefits from this, right? Yeah, Even going into Warwalkers, yes. um, benefit Wraith Lords, yep. benefit... There are so many things in this book that benefit from Move and Shoot because it, it is an army that wanted to be mobile mm -hmm. and it, it otherwise kind of was punished for being mobile. So although this helps the entire game, uh, Eldar is one of the factions helped the most. I might even go as far as to say it's, it, it is the faction helped the most by mm -hmm. this. Yeah, absolutely. I would say so. And, and we can't um, we can't emphasize this enough that yes, in one on one hand we're thinking about being able to hit better, but right. generally speaking, the way you played um, basically all these things, you were hitting just about as well, but you were sacrificing movement, and now you're gaining all of that movement, which yeah. is very very important in the new edition. Absolutely. The other thing that really changed is the idea that uh, line of sight weapons. Um, can be a little more, uh, mm -hmm. little more valuable, or weapons that ignore line of sight. Yeah, side. totally. So it really favors um, shooting armies um, because of the fact that if you touch into a piece of terrain, if, there have, if they have windows or anything, you can actually now shoot through it, right? Um, so on one hand, you, things are much, much more visible unless you are completely out of line of sight uh, behind the building, right? Uh, the, the Eldar vehicles, they are kind of floating. They have a decent amount of height that often... Even if you're behind a uh, building that had the first floor blocked, right. you could still be shot if they had a bit of an angle, things like this. Especially really tall units. Yeah. Um, absolutely. That, that's actually a very big point, right? Your yeah. riptides could see down the windows into my Eldar tanks. Yeah. But now that completely blocks. Um, and so this gives us a couple things. One, it means you're much less likely to be alpha striped, so you'll be yes. able to do your thing. And two, we have things like the Night Spinners and even the Fire Prism with the Stratagem that can actually shoot when they can't actually see their target, yeah. right? So you're actually risking virtually nothing in a, in the realm where it was actually quite hard to do that before, and you're reaching pretty much the entire board. Yeah, one of the things we've noticed is anytime you have vehicles with high speed and fly, yep. it's really easy for you to keep them safe turn one, mm -hmm. turn two, as long as you want, yep. and then you can almost always be the person who shoots first. That's right. Because you could stay hidden, you could jump over that terrain, but also you can move far enough to jump over that terrain and touch another terrain piece. Yes to get line of sight through the center of the board. So this change to the new obscuring rule really allows you to stay safe longer, but then ultimately when you choose to shoot, you have better line of sight. So it's a win-win on durability for you and on offense for you. Absolutely. Now one thing that's kind of an interesting edge case here is talking about things like Dark Reapers. Right. Now Dark Reapers always wanted to be in ruins, out of line of sight, they would pop up to a second floor, they would shoot, they would fire and fade back. Yeah. Now, um, in some sense, this got worse because you will almost never gain the benefit of cover when you're fire and fading, right? Because you want to be off the cover, completely hidden. That's right. Pop in, be visible and shoot, and then pop back. Um, so in, in some senses it's worse, but in, in a lot of senses it actually just changes the way that they can play, the way that they position. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that's just going to be something something to relearn. And um, I don't know, it's just it's just interesting. It, I think. It's you could still do the same technique. It's yeah. just uh, it still works. Now you have to come out of the terrain. So if someone has indirect fire, you're not getting the cover save. Right. Um, makes them a little more vulnerable to indirect fire. One thing that that's nature. interesting with them is because they're a small unit. Um, I don't even know if you're going to be doing fire and fade as much on them. Right. This right. game. Um, like we said, is a lot of line of sight blocking in some cases, some that you can peek through, but there's a lot of angles that happen when you're doing long range fire, right? right? And so they can they can more likely than the vehicles sit in an alley, have these lanes of fire and be shooting from there and actually not need to fire and fade, which yeah. I actually kind of like because, I mean, you know, I have my three night spinners that are hidden. I have two of my fire prisons that are hidden. I have one that shoots and then fire fades back. Yeah. Now virtually my entire army is hidden. Um, so it's just kind of adapting to those new stratagems that actually might 
give yeah. me some new options that well, weren't available. Speak, you know, Fire and Fade is one of those things that uh, a lot of the Elder Stratagems actually are pretty costly. Mm -hmm. And you are actually getting a lot more CP in the new edition. Tell so for Eldar in particularly. Yes. And so that is something where they might be able to afford some of these more expensive strats a little more often than they used to be able to. Oh, absolutely. I think you're going to be popping a lot of these, these utility um, strats much more often than you would be able to before yeah. without having to pay for like, you know, nine units of rangers or whatever it might be. Yeah, absolutely. Another thing that we're assuming is that because we've seen so many benefits to vehicles and monsters that we're going to see many more of them in the upcoming meta. That's right. And really, the Eldar is one of the best yes. at destroying these vehicles. Almost every one of your vehicles outshoots any other faction's vehicles in a, in a straight shoot-off. Yeah. And uh, that's going to put you at a great advantage if you're an Eldar player in that vehicle meta. That's right. Um, one on one, they can absolutely outshoot most vehicles. And yeah. if you really need to take t take something down that was big, they're kind of the best faction to do that between Doom and Jinx and all these tools. Yeah. So we think tanks are really powerful. So we would tank tanks, uh, and then facing against Eldar, they're perfectly suited to be uh, dealing with that. So that's yeah. really exciting. So one other thing that's very, very powerful about Eldar, kind of their signature move, is their mobility. Right? Yes, of course. Everything is so fast, even their, their regular uh, infantry can move yeah. very, very fast. And so, of course, with the smaller board size, this is huge. Yeah, this is big in many ways. Not only does it mean you're more likely going to be able to go from your deployment zone mm -hmm. onto an objective, yep. because the distances are smaller, but it also means that you're going to be able to stay relative safety with things like your shining spears that's right and then go across the table at to almost any threat they can reach right anywhere they already had an enormous threat range yeah but the reduction in table size is very meaningful people mm -hmm. who wanted to hide deep in their deployment zone that's right um now that deployment zone isn't very deep and yeah. so they can get in there and so eldar is really at striking range of both objectives and your units at almost all times because of their speed absolutely so one other thing is uh, Eldar are known for the mobility, but also their pow powerful psychers. Yes, of course. So there's a couple interesting things with that. One is, of course, the changes to line of sight, uh, which hurt uh, short short infantry and things like that right. a lot, um, especially especially psychers that need to see things, right? The new character targeting rules are kind of, of weird. But most of the Eldar, almost all of the Eldar spells don't require line yeah, of sight. Yeah, they ignore line of sight. So that is fantastic. Um, combine that with their sort of mid-range, right? It's either 18 or 24, generally. Yeah. Um, they are very happy to move up into one of those L's, stay completely hidden, yeah. cast Doom And of course, Jinx. those ranges are now better as well. Exactly. It hits yeah. much more of the board. So that's nice. Um, one other thing is you notice there's an entire group of secondaries for the missions that yeah. are all about psychers. Uh, and this is honestly, honestly something that a lot of armies kind of just lose out on. Yeah. Um, some of them are kind of difficult. Uh, you need powerful psychers that can get in position, can cast, and the bonuses to, to that cast won't be really denied. Nice. Yeah. Right. Because here's the key: if you take these secondary objectives, yeah. um, and you fail to cast, you'll mm -hmm. just lose out on a lot of points. That's right. Right. There's two of them in particular: one where you have to do a ritual, and then one yep. where you have to target characters, I believe. Yep. And both of them are very risky if mm -hmm. your opponent can deny. But the Elder have the ability to add so many pluses to their cast That's right. that you used to put those into key spells, but now you could put those into getting your secondaries and all of a sudden, you've picked up your secondaries very easily. And that's a, that's a funny thing, right? Because those spells both have a warp charge of three. Yeah. Which means they're virtually impossible to fail, but the truth is... They, they actually is, become impossible to fail, right? Because you can have plus three. That's right, that's right. Um, and so that's the thing, is you are more worried about your opponent's ability to deny them than you yeah. are just getting them off in the first place. So, kind of a weird sideways move for some of the Eldar. Well, that, that uh, yeah. kind of leans into the idea that Eldar is good in general at secondaries. Oh my gosh. If you've yes. seen the secondary objectives in 9th edition, they are very hard, extremely hard to complete. If you just read through it and looked at your most recent army list and said, how would I complete these? You'd be hard pressed to get even half even points half. most of the time. That's right. We actually feel Eldar is in a great place to pick up almost full points because of their mobility, because of their psychers. Um, they're really in a great spot to be able to play the secondary objectives, um, which they play a lot better than the primary objective. That's right, 100%. Um, they're great at doing things like the uh, getting in each table quarter, popping in the back. Yeah. Again, Psychic Ritual is great. By the way, that Psychic Ritual, you only need to do it three times to max out. Yeah. So that's exciting. Um, and even things like uh, while we stand, we fight, right? If you are playing one of these tank builds where all the tanks are roughly the same amount of points, right. obviously these are a bit more expensive. Um, you want to keep these things alive anyways. Again, they can be hidden. So the secondaries are really, really nice for Eldar. Yeah, and I think, and they definitely did need it because scoring the primaries is a little more challenging. Yeah, for them. So, let's, so let's talk about that because that is yeah. probably one of the big negatives for the army. Eldar um, traditionally have been very good at popping onto points, capping it, dying, or, move, or sorry, not dying, but they would uh, quicken away, things like that. They would be very cagey with their opponent. That's right. But unfortunately now with the primary mission, again, every single primary mission hold an objective, hold a couple objectives, hold more, and all of this stuff has to happen 
at your next command phase, which yeah. means you have to survive to actually do that, right? You can't just put five Dire Avengers on an objective no. at the end of the turn. They're not going to survive till the next turn. Yeah. And so the Eldar's units are fairly expensive. They're not all that durable. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you're going to need to start doing really to offset this is to probably use a combination of transports and troops. So uh, it's already been a classic play. Take a Wave Serpent up. Put some Dire Avengers in it. Yep. That's the way you're going to have to hold objectives. And hey, that's going to work really well. It's great. But, uh, but it's going to require some clever play. 100%. So the other sort of elephant in the room is the fly keyword. Yeah. Um, this faction is uh, probably one of the hardest hits. Yeah, it's probably the second hardest hit after Tau. That's right. Um, and the fly keyword no longer allows you to fall back and shoot, um, which is which is pretty big. Yeah, there was only a couple armies in the game that had a ton of fly um, and were, were very um, shooty based, right? That's they right. weren't melee based. Um, and that was really Eldar and Tau. Yeah. Um, so the tanks are kind of in a weird spot where, okay, yeah. they can't get tagged now, but Honestly, I'd probably rather have the fly keyword the way it was before than that. Uh, I agree. Uh, so, so that is definitely a big hit to them. Uh, things like Shining Spears, they do get hit, but in my mind, we still have stratagems to get around it. Um, so if you have a key unit uh, that you're okay spending CP to be able to be able to do, still do that, That's right. then you can get around it. It's you can really still fall back and shoot with CP. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you could still do it a little bit. And honestly, a lot of these uh, other Eldar vehicles can be really far back. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as bad, I think. Right. And they also don't have... I mean, the, the, the small units, their cheap units are not terrible, so they have decent um, access to good screens. Yeah. So it's not the end of the world, um, but something to definitely keep an eye out on. Yeah, another change to the meta is not only towards tanks, but we also think towards multiple small units. Mm -hmm. And what this means is that armies will be spreading out their threats into smaller units to go and grab the board. Um, because we don't have kill points in the mission, that's why this is happening. But the Eldar really excel at killing several large units. That's right. They don't actually do that good of a job at killing multiple small units. No, absolutely. I mean, they have a decent firepower from each one, but it's all, not always the most shots. They want to really doom and jinx something, that's target right. it down. They can do that almost better than any other army in the game. Um, and unfortunately, yeah. that's not really that important anymore, right? So Yeah, that's, that's going to be, that's definitely going to be a challenge for them. Um, this is also an army that used to overwatch particularly well, yes. and that's now something that they've largely lost as well. That's right. I'm really worried about things, like, again, like Shining Spears, that yeah. would be very mobile to get up into the opponent's face, and they would say, right. okay, you can try to shoot me, but we're very durable. You can yeah. try to charge us, but we have, what, 36 shuriken uh, catapults, yeah. nine of the lances coming in, especially with Guide. Yeah. Very, very scary. That's gone. You could spend a CP. You can to still get it spend back. a CP, but yeah. yeah. So that's that's kind of a that's a bummer. One of the nice <laughs> things I will say, even though you've lost the Overwatch across the army, mm -hmm. normally your entire army wasn't being charged at once. That's very so true. So if if it exactly. is just your spears being charged, spend the one CP Overwatch. Mm -hmm. You could still do it. You have more CP I to probably burn. Probably would, yeah. But um, if someone is doing a mass charge in a turn, um, you're you're generally losing that efficiency because exactly. they actually did have a fair number of high value shots mm -hmm. that that would have gotten in there normally. That's right. That's right. So uh, something that Eldar loved to do, and is, everyone else hated, it was so amazing. Was a stack multiple minuses to hit. Right? That's right. They would make it so that their flyers are minus one, plus their late talk, plus they lightning fast. That's right. They're basically impossible to hit. Yeah, um, minus but, three to hit planes was oh. nobody's idea. Of well, especially you, right? Yeah. Playing tower was very, very punishing. I yeah. mean, even for orcs, that was kind of rough. But um, positives and minuses to hit all cap out at one. Yeah. So what this means is you have minus one. Uh, you can't stack, well, you can stack it, right? So if someone has a plus one to hit, for example, and you have minus two, that does actually, um, it is cumulative, that does turn into a minus one and then yeah. stops capping. So it's not that they don't do anything, it's just we don't really think people are going to be teching into stacking all these minuses, spending command points. It's just not worth it as often, right? Like if you get this plane up to minus three to hit, yeah. Um, most of the time people are just going to take that minus one. Now there's right. some targets, right? If my Tau crisis suits came down mm -hmm. and I gave them uh, uh, drop zone clear for plus one to hit, and I right. put five marker lights for plus two to hit, yep. I'd still be at minus one. That's right. <laughs> Great. That's good. Right. Um, but there's not too many situations where your opponent is getting plus two or more to hit, so it's just not worthwhile for you to tech into minuses to hit, especially with the flyers, because people are already going to be like moving with heavy weapons, right. shooting at them. They're going to be almost at Stacking minus four. Stacking already, yeah. Yeah, they're going to be at like <laughs> minus five to hit this plane, and yeah. then still be hitting at minus one. So that is that is a big strategy that's lost. I don't think mm. anyone's going to cry over the loss of that strategy. I won't. Um, no, everyone yes. disliked it. Most people had already moved away from it, to be honest yeah, with you. Yeah, there was definitely a trend. But uh, it's something you can't do anymore, even if you wanted to. <laughs> that's right. So Eldar have extremely powerful psychers that are largely independent of the rest of the army, yeah. right? They would throw buffs, but as we said, they have a, they have a decent range. Um, and they would kind of hang back in the midfield and really use the, t the character targeting rules as they existed yeah. in 8th edition. 
Now with ninth, of course, this changes. Uh, you have to stay within three inches of uh, a unit that has at least three more models yeah. or a vehicle. And this, uh, this is really scary for, again, these spells like Doom and Jinx that want to get up in your face throw them out there. Um, so it is a lot scarier for them. Yeah, uh, targeting characters became a lot easier and the Eldar characters are not only very valuable, they're very fragile. Yeah, they and so if you get to shoot at them with anything of value, they can go down pretty easily. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that Eldar infantry, like if they're near some rangers or dire avengers, they're yeah. paper thin. No. And so you can't really use them as effective screens. Maybe the rangers if you're popping strats to hit on six and things sure, like that. Yeah. But the, um, the idea is you're probably gonna have to be keeping these characters near Things like wave serpents or, or things that are or vehicles. You, or even a wraith lord. Or wraith lord, um, yeah. I believe has enough wounds to, to block. So just kind of having a vehicle that comes up. Again, we really do yeah. like the wave serpent. It was always amazing, but it actually ha it comes into its own, again, as this sort of utility role. Yeah. Delivering troops, protecting for your characters, things like that. Um, and again, you know, um, a grain of salt is the fact that this is a mid-board game. We ignore a line of sight. So there are ways of getting around it, but we can't be as... Uh, as blatant about just these characters sitting out in the, yeah. in the open like you could. Right? Yeah, if you have characters on foot, I agree. I think a Wraith Lord is a great thing. Nice mm -hmm. little bodyguard. Yep. Um, it's actually very thematic as well. Right. <laughs> um, but if you've got uh, the characters on bike, think about maybe the Wave Serpent can keep up speed with them. That's right. Um, but really, keeping them near infantry. Uh, <laughs> maybe if you've got a 10-man squad of, of Rangers right. uh, and you're popping the strat to hit on sixes, <laughs> that's about the best you could do yeah. probably for, for defense. Absolutely. That is one of the nice things. Even though you can't have minus three to hit anymore, the right. Rangers still hit on sixes with that stratagem. It's so good, and that's the thing, right? Because you're like, okay, why would I take a late talk Rangers? Because of that strat. It it's is a great so, strat. so powerful. Especially you're trying to hold that objective in the corner with some Rangers. Yeah, because you can. The thing yeah. was before with that with that strat, right? You have to do it at the start, so you have to you have to guess which Ranger squad your opponent's going to want to shoot, yeah. and you actually have more now control of that clear. than before. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't like, well, I'm just trying to get the easy kill, right? Yeah. So why don't we go and take a look at a few very specific strategies, mm -hmm. and then afterward we'll cover some lists. Sounds good. Let's take a look. So in this, this example, we'd like to take you through the Humble Wave Serpent and how powerful it is in this mission, yeah. uh, in this current mission. One of the key things is, as we've pointed out before, the Eldar are one of the best at scoring the secondary objectives, but you're going to have to be a little more clever to hold the primary objectives. So we're going to show you how the Wave Serpent really makes that easy mode for you. That's right. So this thing is extremely fast. Uh, it can be very durable with uh, uh, Spirit Stones in it. We're also going to go ahead and up upgrade the engines to Star Engines. Which is something you never used to do I before. I didn't really use it. It's 10 points, um, but it's, uh, or at least in the current points. Right. 2d6 additional when you every time you advance. And you're right. starting at a baseline of 16 inches. 16. So you can be moving on average, what, 23 inches. So yeah. very, very fast, right? What's crucial about this is it allows you to stay back mm -hmm. safe in your deployment zone. And so you could be in a spot where your wave servants can't be targeted. Right. But when you want to jump out on an objective, because the board is even smaller, right. um, it's almost a guarantee that you can get out onto it. 100%. So there's a couple things to consider when you're trying to screen out objectives and capture objectives. One is if you really are faced against a uh, shooting threat, something that doesn't have uh, bodies or just combat ability in general, you can approach an objective one way, and if you have something that will actually be able to reach you, we can approach it a different way. That's absolutely right. So the Wave Serpent is incredibly durable against shooting and against combat, mm -hmm. um, but you're going to have to think of them differently because the Wave Serpent's only a single model, yeah. and so if your opponent gets another model onto that objective or obsec, they're going to control it. So we're going to show how you screen the objective against combat threats and how you just hold the objective against shooting threats. So what we've got is three Wave Serpents here. They've all got uh, Guardians or Dire Avengers in them. Those, these, right. those are interchangeable for our purposes. Yep. And we've got two objectives up the board. Now, uh, against this here, we, we've just got a representative army. On this side of the board, we've got uh, Wolf and Dreadnought. He's mm -hmm. representing a combat threat on this side of the board. That's right. On that side of the board, we have a very powerful land raider yeah. um, who represents a very strong shooting threat. That's right. Now, because of lines of sight, you're going to have objectives that are more in range of shooting targets mm -hmm. and more in range of combat targets. So what we're doing is we're going to move up these three wave serpents to capture these objectives. Absolutely. And the cool thing is you can set these up at kind of as we have them here, even where we have one in the middle, ready to respond one direction or the other, yeah. right? We could pull two here if the combat things were flipped. You never know. So you have that ridiculous amount of flexibility, which is very yeah. powerful. Because with those uh, star engines, you're moving an average of 23 inches. That's right. Which, just to show you a sense from this wave serpent, <laughs> What 23 looks like, and that's that's if you roll average. Yeah, You exactly. could roll better than that, right? That's right. And so uh, this is very, very fast. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this first wave serpent, we're going to move it up to here, and what we're going to do is make a bit of a triangle in front of that objective. That's right. So one of the things to consider is it does your opponent have obsec bodies, right? So if they do, this becomes very, very important for a number of reasons. 
So you can see now what Brian's doing, doing is he's measuring out three inches from the objective and pushing these things forwards to try to prevent any ability for your opponent to get within three without completely destroying a wave serpent and all the troops that get out of it, right? That's because right. Remember, even if this guy dies, you might even like adjust it like this and get all your troops out along here. You can still start blocking from the, that objective, things like that. Um, and so you just you're you're creating this insurmountable obstacle of things that have to go perfectly for your opponent to even have a chance of getting that objective back. Right. To win this game, keep in mind, normally you need to hold one objective, two objectives, and more objectives. That's in right. most cases, that turns into three objectives. Mm -hmm. So you've got one maybe backfield. It's definitively yours. It's very easy to hold. But here now, we're going to take a very defended objective. We've got this Dreadnought who comes up. Not only is he not within three inches, mm -hmm. so he even if we got two Dreadnoughts there, we're not contesting. Right. Even if you had a unit of Thunderwolf Cav, Yep. And they had three of them, which outnumbers us. Right. They're not getting in range of that objective. That's very important. Now, if that Thunderwolf Cav unit or this Dreadnought blows up one of these Wave Serpents, we're getting out with all of our OBSEC. That's and right. they don't have, uh, they didn't charge this unit, so they can't fight it. Right. And so this objective is definitively ours at the start of our next turn. That's how we score and that we just picked up those key uh, primary points. That's right, and it's important to see the way that we position it, right? Because ideally we want to keep the Dire Avengers or the Guardians inside of the vehicle because they can easily get shot down, let's be honest. Um, but, we, so, but we also only get two models on the board if we have our Wave Serpents, right? So we want to position them in a way that we are taking advantage of our big, tough bodies um, and in a way that even if those die, we then get the benefit of the additional bodies, right? That's so right. you want to make sure that no matter what your opponent does, it's a benefit for you, right? Exactly. Well, now on this other objective, where there are no melee threats, we can safely just move a single Wave Serpent up. That's right. And you can actually be careful. The Wave Serpent itself is physically large. You can actually put it in such a way to bully that objective. So even this uh, Land Raider would have trouble getting mm -hmm. around and contesting that objective. That's right. Normally these threats would be further back, though. Sure, sure. But in the event that he blew up that Wave Serpent, of course we have our Guardians inside. They'll just pop out. And who can jump out. And so no, nothing they can do can take that objective unless they can manage to clear the Wave Serpent and the Guardians, right. um, which is very tough. So this one actually becomes very threatening for your opponent. One of the things that we've seen a lot um, in games is the fact that uh, things that are in the midboard can then run over to uh, the opponent's objectives, turn off, of, turn off things, kind of contest objectives, things right. like that. And so they probably don't really want to shoot at this because they have to shoot, they have to kill the Wave Serpent, they have to kill all the Guardians, all that just to take you off the point. But on the other hand, if they don't do that, you have this ridiculous range, right? These guys are moving seven base. You can play a CP to auto advance six yeah. and just run them onto an objective or get a recon, something like that. So it puts you in this very good position to react to whatever happens in the game. Yeah, you can see how these transports are far more valuable in ninth edition so than they were. And in fact, transports in general are. But what we just did with these wave servants, you can't do with a Razorback. Nope. This thing moved 23 inches. It came over terrain. Yep. Right? It It's far more valuable. It's great. Um, and But if you didn't have these transports here, if you got up on these objectives, you would have lost them. These Dreadnoughts would come up, they would shoot and charge, they would take the objective from you, it would be very easy to blast That's 10 right. Guardians, 10 Dire Avengers off an objective. Without these Wave Serpents, yeah. you're not gonna be holding those primaries. Nope. Um, so we really think that this is Eldar's number one way to hold these primary objectives. And without it, I think you're gonna be in a tough spot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is the tactic that we've tried uh, num numerous times, it works very well. Um, so definitely be practicing this and the positioning as you play your games of Eldar. So let's take a look at another very different example. All right. So we're gonna take a look at an extremely important example for actually every army in the game, but Eldar and Dire Avengers in particular will be very interested in perfecting this technique. Yeah, this is a quirk of ninth edition, yep. and it's a small rule that you might otherwise miss. But basically what it says is in the shooting phase, for example, when you choose to take a save, um, someone shoots at you and they do a wound, mm -hmm. Uh, now, you get to choose which model to take that save against. That's, That's right. fairly typical. Yep. But whoever you choose to take that save against, you continue have to taking wounds against that model for the rest of the phase. So not just the rest of the, of the shots from that unit, the rest of the phase. That's right. So I'm going to show you an example where that comes in really significant. Now, we've got these Dire Avengers. Now, if you don't know, the Exarch has a power here. And in this case, we've given the 4-up invuln That's right. ability. So the rest of these guys just have 4-up armor saves, but mm -hmm. he has a 4-up invulnerable save. Right, right. Now, up against them, We've got a Space Wolves character here with a Bolt Pistol. Yep. And then we have a unit of uh, Terminators over here with two melta guns, mm -hmm. um, or Combi Meltas in this case. And what we want to do is, ideally, we want to be able to use our Invulnerable save against those Meltas. Right. Um, and normally, we'd want to take our normal Armor save against those bolt that Absolutely. Bolter. But the Space Wolves player, being smart, shoots with the Bolt Pistol first. 
right? So this puts us in an interesting spot, right? Because before, as we said, we would just take it on a regular guy, then switch to the invuln, but whoever we start taking the saves on yeah. now, we have to continue. Yeah, and you have a 50-50 chance to save this. That's right. And the uh, Exarch has two wounds. Mm -hmm. So let's just say the, the uh, pistol hits and it wounds. Yep. If you choose to take it on a regular Dire Avenger mm -hmm. and it survives, yep. that means now the next shot coming in from the melted gun also has to go against that Dire Avenger, so, and you will definitely die. It, uh, yeah, essentially automatically kills that guy, then you can go into your invul. You can't, there's no more flip-flopping back and forth. This obviously right. is big for things like Storm Shields. Um, and, and, and this is a fundamental change, right? This is very, very important. So in this case, because we know the Exarch has two wounds, the right. smarter move is actually to take the save on the Exarch with a 50-50 to pass or not. And even if you fail it, you still are still, still alive. alive. Now we have to take the rest of the saves on that Exarch. So luckily for us, we know that the only other thing that's within range is just two melta shots, right? If there are bolters, it becomes harder. But with, with these scenarios, we can say, cool, we're going to take an invuln. We have 50-50, another one 50-50. At worst, you know, we're much more likely to lose nothing or one model, right? Yeah. So, that's a big so this actually gives you a chance to tank all of these shots and take no damage whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Now, you still might lose your Exarch. Sure. But this at least gives you a chance to go hot. If you do it in the other way, you're almost guaranteed to lose at least one model. That might not sound like much, but if we had many more models on the table, uh, that could lose you the unit. Or if we even had a contesting unit here, it could instantly lose, even one model could lose you the objective. Oh, 100%. And so this is actually a, an example that we've tried to boil down to the essentials right. in order to kind of explain the intricacies of it, right? This is a deceptively complicated rule and is, is actually very difficult to handle in the game. So this is something that um, as you come up um, in your games, you'll want to kind of keep an eye out. You'll learn how to practice it. There's a lot of things. There's, a, there's an increasing number of things that do this, right? I'm thinking yeah. of like healers, Aegis, giving Marines a five up invuln, and there's certain things you want to tank with. So right. perfecting this is going to be critical to actually playing to the maximum yeah, capacity it's for a your little, army. It's a little efficiency, but it's yeah. going to count uh, across the entire of a game. It's a big deal. So why don't we jump ahead and take a look at a few of the army lists that we've got in mind for the Craft World. Sounds good. So what we'd like to do now is take a look at a couple different army builds. Yeah, I think there is a lot of different lists you could build yeah. out here, um, and a lot of units got better. Um, but we're going to talk about things that we think are definitely going to work. There's a lot of things out there that are going to work, but these are things that we've tried and uh, we think can be effective. Absolutely. So the first list we want to talk about is, um, I like to call it Maximum Daka. Yeah. It's just all-out firepower that takes advantage of the new line of sight rules and the new move and shoot rules. That's right. So this list, yeah. the core of it is a tons of heavy support slots, so you're going to be running yeah. that special detachment to do that. Um, so we're looking at three fire prisms, a couple of crimson uh, hunters. Um, I actually like the warwalkers; they've been kind of interesting yeah, to play. I'm into warwalkers as well. They're they're cheap, decently durable, and now they actually they do move and they're fast. They're cool. They're weird they're little always, models that you don't get, you, like haven't, you don't see in eighth edition. <laughs> but now we can actually recommend them. It's yeah, nice, right? Actually good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's that. Um, and of course, you could swap some things out for things like night spinners, but often I found out I was running out of points for that. Yeah, I think um, night spinners, the ignore line of sight. You could get around that now that these vehicles are so fast, can touch terrain, and they could see most of everything. Exactly. So the, the premium you pay for the Night Spinner may not be worth it. It's still a great unit. That's though. right. And that's kind of a flux slot to me between Night Spinners and Dark Reapers. Again, Dark Reapers are more vulnerable in a lot of ways, but yeah. it kind of depends what you prefer to play. So that's the core of the list. Um, you still manage to, to try to max out on, um, on troops, right? For that one, you only get three slots, I believe. So it's, it could be worth just getting a patrol for an extra warlock and a couple extra troops to give you some screening because that is absolutely the weakness of this army, right? Yes. There's a, oh, I'd say okay. There's generally two two weaknesses. One, this yeah. one isn't trying to play the mission as aggressively. Yeah. It's trying to be extremely oppressive yeah. against your opponent and really stop them from holding anything. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of you trying to hold all the board, you're just stopping them from holding the board. Yeah. And especially if you come up against an opponent that is uh, tank heavy, that's right, or that is very elite heavy, mm -hmm. you are going to you're gonna wreck them really, really fast. Now, if you came up against someone that was the ultimate Tyranid's Horde, maybe you're in a bit of trouble here. Definitely gonna be tougher. Uh, that'll be a little harder. So this one really plays towards a period of time in the meta, which mm -hmm. um, we're gonna have to see if, if that kind of comes together. Yeah, absolutely. We think, um, despite the fact that the game is fundamentally about board, board control, there are a few armies or builds within those armies that can that can bring enough firepower to yeah. actually play this kind of this style, right? Yeah. Um, and I mean, it's gonna hit super hard. Yeah, um, and we've seen Tau, Tau can play this way, uh, Admech Ad can play this way, even Space Marines can play this way, Absolutely. just like pure offense. Yeah, so there's and just a few. It, it, is, it does work right now specifically because of the added efficiency on line of sight mm -hmm. and the added efficiency on vehicles. 100%. So that's just why this works. But 
uh, like any time you build an army that's skewed, it has these instant lose conditions. And as that's you're right. saying, if someone can flood the board or someone can flood and tag your army, mm -hmm. um, you're just going to find yourself really unable to do much. Yeah, that's right. So uh, this isn't uh, this isn't an all comers list. This is the list that's going <laughs> to do well 80, 90 percent of the time, and then 10 percent of the time right. you're going to have to be really clever to win those games. Bridger likes this list, so yeah. we'll just say that. <laughs> it's a very Bridger list. <laughs> um, so why don't we talk about a list that is more of an all-comer list yeah. and plays the mission a little more aggressively. So this one is kind of banking off the things that we discussed earlier, which is the fact that Eldar plays the secondaries very, very well. Yeah. And so what this list is going to look like is the return of the Wave Serpent. Uh, always been great, don't call it a comeback, but yeah. we think they're extra powerful here. So we're talking about taking lots of Wave Serpents, Filling them with uh, Guardians, but also Dire Avengers, yep. I really like, because you can take the Exarch with the Involves, and um, things like Bikes, uh, Swooping Hawks even, to be basically Deep Strike. The idea is, your army will die. Yes. But you're going to win the game, because you're going to yep. get lots of your secondaries. Uh, the primaries will be a bit tougher, but this is where Wave Serpents are actually still good, because they can sit on a point, hold it, they blow up the Wave Serpent, your guys pop out, you still hold yep. it. And so it's not about killing at all. It's, it's an entirely different mindset. Yeah. In fact, you're, every turn, you're only focused on how do I get my most points. You don't even need to have, be focused so much on how does my opponent not get their max points. Yeah. Um, you only need to do that if the game's going to be really, really close. Right. But realistically, you're just saying, how do I get max points? How do I max my primary? How do I max my secondary? And I'll sacrifice my army to do it as long as I have enough in reserve to get my points and max out. That's right. And you don't have to max out all five turns. You, no. you only need generally three good turns. Yep. Um, for some of the secondaries, you might need a fourth turn. That's a very um, good point. But that's about it. Yeah. And you don't care if you get tabled. Your opponent doesn't instant win if, you table, if you're tabled. Your opponent doesn't get max points if you're, if you're tabled. That's right. So you don't really care. That's great. So this one is, uh, it's actually a lot of fun to play, right? It might seem like, oh, you just stand on points, but it's very, very dynamic. You have to move, you can actively, di uh, you can, so one of the things about primary, right, is it's harder to hold the primary for this one, but it's also very good at denying it, right? So one of the great, great strategies in ninth edition is just throwing a few troops onto an objective, denying, taking yeah. down banners, things like that. Uh, and so there's a lot going on. We've had a lot of fun uh, with this army. Yeah. And then we will, just kind of wanted to show you two builds that are It's a very classic so way to different. play Eldar. It's yeah. fast, you're taking the objectives, you're coming mm -hmm. out of nowhere and That's saying right. this is mine, and then all of a sudden it's like, wait, my army's not... You know, there, it's nothing here is so super deadly. Mm -hmm. Why am I losing this game? Right, <laughs> and uh, and that's just what will happen. Before you know it, they're up on the score, and you're you're still trying to kill some wave serpents. And, that's right. Uh, it's just yeah, they just win. That's how that's how Eldar works. That's right. So uh, we've taken a look at some of the positives, uh, some of the negatives, ways of dealing with these, and also yeah. new strategies that have changed within Ninth Edition. Uh, so we, of course, are going to be running a battle report with the new Eldar, a variation off one of these lists, yep. for sure, uh, this week. So definitely stay tuned for that. Um, we're really excited to show you guys that. We are just putting out a ton of content, yes. and you don't want to miss any of it. Yeah, we've got uh, faction focuses for almost every uh, faction in the game, and of course, battle reports for um, all the factions that we're covering, as yeah. well as many more. We're going to be doing videos when the new books drop, whether those be new codexes, the GT book, the Munitorum book with new points. So a lot of stuff to look forward to. That's right. So we uh, will hopefully see you guys very, very soon. Um, if you enjoyed it, definitely like and subscribe so you can stay updated. And we will catch you guys on the next video. See you then.